racer here for DragRacing.tv and powered by Strutmasters.com. It's another quarantine special, and we've got Doug Foley on the Zoom line. Doug, look, let's dive into this thing. At Phoenix, you mentioned to me that you're a bit of a workaholic, and you seem never to take a break. I'm curious, though, with everything that is corona going on right now, is business as normal, or has it shaped things up and the workaholic has had to take a break or two? No, the workaholic, well, first of all, hello, and has, uh, I'm glad to be with you. But, uh, yeah, no, the workaholic is a workaholic. That never stops. Um, it, it's it's, it's ever-changing, of course. You know, uh, we thought we were on a roll. And, uh, of course, the, our lovely governor decided as of, Mon as of this coming Monday we're shut down. Um, but fortunately, being a land developer and, um, you know, building new, new home sites, um, I'm kind of in that um, category that they say we can still continue going to work. So fortunately, that's good. Um, so we've gone full speed ahead. We have literally gone full speed ahead. I'm actually getting more work done now than I was previously um, for the sake that there are some companies that have slowed down their process and all of that. Um, for us, we went full speed ahead. We figured if we can get houses built quicker and we knew eventually we were gonna go back racing and the more houses I get built before I go back racing, then the better off for me. Um, but now it's starting to get, <clears throat> We were, we were good for the first maybe three weeks of this thing, but now it's starting to catch up. Now when they start, you know, making these mandatory stay home, stay in place types of things, um, I got to imagine some of my contractors are going to listen to that and choose not to work. Um, but even more importantly, we're finding out the hard way that <clears throat> just because we can build them doesn't mean people are going to be buying them. So that's now our concern has shifted from let's get as much done as we can quickly to are we going to end up getting these homes done? And even though they may be sold or whatever, the coronavirus, the banks, the, you know, the lenders, just the whole process is going to slow down to the point where we may end up with a bunch of houses sitting there that are looking pretty and, uh, don't uh, don't actually bring in any any money for a while. Well, things are definitely on lockdown in New York, where I'm at. And you grew up in New York, from what I understand, then later on moved to New Jersey. I've got to ask, how did you pick up the drag racing bug in being in New York? I mean, it's nothing but a big city. At least that's what everybody thinks about. So how did you pick up the bug? And also with the move to New Jersey, I understand that you've got some favorite moments from English Town. So please share those moments and how you got the bug? Well, the first thing was, is I was always, always just like a motorhead. I just really, and I don't know where I got it because nobody in my family was into cars. It was kind of weird for us. It's a, I'm, I'm truly the first generation of my family, as far as people that really enjoyed the, uh, the sport to the level we do. Um, where I came from, there was really no tracks per se, right outside the city. You could go out to the Hamptons. At that time, West Hampton was open, uh, which was probably, you know, on a Saturday. God, it may only be 40 miles, but it was two and a half hours driving. Um, but um, for the most part, we started as street racers. That's all we knew. You know, we used to go to the Wedge Inn in the Bronx. And every Friday and Saturday night, you could race down a Wedge Inn right on the Henry Hudson Parkway and, uh, and on the Hutch. You could run on those uh, on those streets, um, and so that was the deal. I just loved being able to take an old car, you know, um, at a '70 split bumper. That was just my favorite car, and one of these days I'm going to decide to duplicate it. But um, just going out and taking that thing to school, I drove to school every day, and you know, at that time it was probably a 13 second high 12 second car, you know. But uh, to drive to school every day, and you know, we're talking back in the '70s, you know, '70s and '80s. Um, you know, that's pretty fast for, for a day driver, you know? So I just, I just loved, I love the mechanics of it. I had a bunch of friends that were just as into it as I was. So we had a little club of guys that, uh, we loved, we, we loved working on them and we loved street racing. Start somewhere and very interesting how you got that start there near the city around it and traveling out. So with English town, 
you know, for me, when I look back at English Town, even though I never got to attend there, it being one of the crown jewel events of NHRA drag racing, a lot of lore, a lot of history there. I just about wore out the 1986 VHS of Drag Racing in Review, and I can just remember Don Garlitz with the moonshot there at English Town. I recently watched the full national event in 86, and a lot of records would be, were broken, and that was a crazy event there at E-Town. For you, what, what's one that you remember? What is a moment there that sticks out? Um, I would say at English Town, well, for me personally, that's where I broke the 330 mile an hour barrier. Okay, so, you know, top all of it, that's going to be one that uh, I happened to run. This was, I'm going to say it was 06, somewhere around there. No, probably 07, that uh, when I was there and um, we went, nobody at that point had broken to 330 in a dragster. We went 330 and then, um, and then right after that, it was funny, the pair behind me was Melanie Troxel, and she went faster than I did, uh, mile an hour wise. And, uh, but, um, so that was, you know, obviously, you know, how many times does, does a guy who, you know, uh, you know, grew up with such a passion for racing ever be able to say he went 330 miles an hour in a dragster? You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Of course, that was when we were a quarter mile. Um, and I think the ET was, I think it was 456 at the time. Um, that thing was on fire. It was just, you know, the last hundred feet, it was, it was running on flames. Um, but, uh, you know, to be able to say that was an accomplishment. So English Town, that's probably my number one accomplishment as far as, you know, just being able to, you know, um, so that was, that, that place has a lot of, a lot of history. And to see that place, you know, now torn apart and be nothing but a parking lot and that is, you know, it, it's it's disturbing for somebody who come it was brought up in that neck of the woods. That's gut wrenching for sure, and I'm imagine even more so for you to have such an intimate relationship with the track and being there racing there, setting such a milestone for me. Someone who never went there, just counting it as such a big event, it's gut wrenching there just in itself. And yes, it's sad that we've lost E Town. Hopefully, in time, some of the new tracks will get that aura to them and become crown jewel events on their own. Speaking of events, let's backtrack just a little bit to Phoenix. Phoenix was a debut for you after 10 years of not being in the cockpit. Uh, give me a rundown very quickly again of the weekend, what you thought, and coming out of Phoenix, what were some new goals and felt the bummer of not being able to run the Gators? Yeah, um, you know, fortunately, we went to, uh, to Phoenix to test first get my license back and do all of that three, I think three weeks prior to the race. Um, and it was great to be back in the car. Great to allow the guys to really gel together. Um, and then to go, you know, to the first event in 10 years, like I said, um, you know, we lost the run that we actually lost two runs there. Okay. We lost one on Friday because, you know, we were new back. We were gelling the team together. We lost the Friday. We, we lost Q1 due to uh, trying to debug some issues we had. And um, so with that, we chose not to rush it to get up there. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we ran decent there. You know, I mean, considering it was our first running competition, um, you know, to be able to go in, you know, an 80, we went, you know, from whatever, 404 to uh, right to an 87. And uh, so we felt pretty good about that. We felt like, okay, that gives us something. You know, eventually you can't just make half track runs. Eventually you have to take it to the finish line and see what it's gonna do. Uh, and even on the 87 run, it wasn't a full track pass. I mean, I took it to the finish line, but it had a hole out late in the, late in the run and, um, and did a little engine damage. But uh, we really feel that that was a, probably a low AD run if we got the opportunity to you know, complete that run properly. So we were feeling good, but then again, now we wake up Saturday morning, it's pouring. <laughs> you know? So, you know, now we have the rain issue, which, you know, uh, how many times does it rain like that in Phoenix? You know, um, I think we got a half inch of rain that day. But, you know, um, I will say the NHRA busted their butt. They did a really good job on getting that thing dried and giving us the opportunity to get out there on Saturday night, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, overall it was a pretty good race, you know, 
it's been a long time since I started out with a brand new team. So to be able to put a report card on it, you know, it, it's hard to do because it, it takes laps. It just does. It takes data. Um, everything is different from when I ran. So, um, you know, overall, I felt like, you know, obviously losing first round, I'm a competitive guy. So losing first round on Sunday is never what you would consider a good race. But it, it, if you put it in perspective, it, it, was not a, it was not a bad race. I'm getting a better feel for the car now. That was a run that I, I did an early shut off because, you know, um, we're one of those teams where, you know, um, other than having, you know, the ability to, you know, um, have the Strutmaster relationship with Chip um, has been great for us. Um, but for the most part, it's a, it's a self-funded team. And, um, you know, we have to be careful on what we do and how we go about it. And on those runs that we choose to complete, how we're going to complete them, you know, the car's got to feel good. And when you're racing, you know, the weather conditions on Sunday there were just unbelievable. You know, if I recall, I think there was a couple 60s that morning, you know. So um, we were a little out of, out of our element. When you're satisfied with going 380s and everybody else is going low 70s and high 60s, you know, you have to take the run in perspective to what you're trying to accomplish and then, you know, just be reasonable about it. So how disappointing was it not to get to run the Gators and it's being rescheduled? Also, with the rescheduling, the realignment of several tracks for the NHRA Mellow Yellow 2020 season, I'm curious, out of the tracks that we're not going to visit, like Epping, Atlanta, and also there in Virginia, were some of those tracks ones that you intended to be at? So the bummer on the Gators and tracks that you might miss out on. Um. I probably hurt the worst out of almost any team in the country. Okay. Um, you could look at obviously KB racing right here in my backyard, but I mean, if you're based out of North Carolina <laughs> and you cancel Atlanta, Z max and Richmond. Okay. If you're you know, a team that's trying to watch your dollars, all three of those races are within three hours of my house, you know? So that's not in you know, the schedule. It was, worst case scenario for us it really was and i will say that it probably hurt how many races we'll attend just because you know can we justify picking a 22 hour round trip compared to a six hour round trip some of those things have to be taken into consideration for sure you know so i think out of most teams yeah i, I would say that there's probably you know um it, it probably hurt us the most I think you can have a very interesting perspective since you were out of the driver's seat for 10 years and you come back after 10 years. So you competed in IHRA, also in HRA. You got that 10 year gap, you come back. Your first weekend back, what were some positives? You just mentioned one about the track prep uh, for the NHRA, but what were some more positives? What were some negatives that you noticed as a driver, uh, as you know, a fan of drag racing yourself, what were things that you noticed the drag racing uh, scene with the NHRA is getting right after 10 years and things that maybe they're not doing as well after 10 years? Well, you know, when we were thinking about this for a year, myself and Tim Lewis met with NHRA. We discussed what we can do, what we can't do, um, trying to put a budget together. And to be honest with you, it's hard to put a budget on a race team until you actually go out and run it. Um, but we even brought up some suggestions that were brought up previously, and a lot of them were shot down, one of them being the potential of going to two-day races. Um, you know, I, I would say the biggest negative that I have for NHRA is their non-flexibility. <clears throat> That's probably the biggest thing that, you know, everything changes life changes we're all sitting here in our house not able to go anywhere okay so if you don't think things change you know uh, give me a break so the so world changes and you know the amount of teams that are out there the sponsorships that are out there just the whole thing has changed and so i think that's my biggest concern with nhra is their reluctancy to look at opportunities 
or look at you know the ability to well if we're not bringing in more sponsors um, at the rate that we were doing before which that's obvious to everybody then let's look at how we reduce the cost and that is definitely something that you know you know we don't we don't have a per run amount yet uh, probably have that by the end of the year of what a true run cost it's hard to figure out um, but truly you know if, if you go and you make two laps and and you're not making you know three or four whatever qualifying runs and you have that ability that's definitely something that I look at that it saves money you know so that's something we mentioned now you look at that or you know discussion that, that you have and then look at the fact that now they came back with several races that are two-day races now is that something that they're truly looking at and if they are i applaud them if this is something that they're saying hey listen maybe we need to start looking at how we keep other teams out there you know the amount of part-time teams <clears throat> has almost equaled the amount of full-time teams which has never been ever in our racing it used to be we had, you know, when I would run Indy or those races, we had typically 24, 28 dragsters. Now we have a field of full-time cars. We have 12 or 11 or whatever we have somewhere in there. So without guys like me and Justin Ashley and, you know, uh, the Richards and the funny car and just all these teams, Lex June, all the, you know, all these teams that are out there that are trying to help, you know, um it, we're kind of important now we we play a bigger role in nhra success and anytime we can reduce the cost of racing for me and or these full-time teams the ability for me to add a race or two because my per race cost has gone down or the ability now to bring in a full-time guy who can help us maintain the car and just make the product better because to us, that's where me and Tim Lewis are at, is we want, you know, our marketing partners like Chip to be able to see that, yes, we're not going to try and go to more races than we're financially capable of, but we're going to try and give him a good product when we do go there. We're going to try and be competitive, and our goal is always to try and be competitive first round and see where it goes from there. So with NHRA, if they're indeed looking at this as potentially some two-day races next year, then I applaud the effort of switching over to that. It could be nothing more than, hey, listen, these teams have gotten beat up pretty bad with losing these races and the expense that these teams have. You know, I'm not in as bad a shape as some of these guys who have 14 full-time guys per team. And, you know, I, I feel for them. That's bad. Um, and they're paying these guys. And I give them a lot of credit for negotiating whatever deal they can to try and keep those guys employed because we need that. Um, but um, my hope is, is that they're truly looking at it as a potential for next year. I truly think we have to reduce the amount of races. I know some tracks don't want to hear that, you know, but we have to. You know, when you look at teams like Don Schumacher Racing, where when I was racing, there was, I think he was filled up. I think he was four and four across the board, you know, and which was maxed out on what you were allowed to by the rules. Um, now that's changing, you know. So um, with that the case, you know, it's going to take teams like us and, and TJ Zizzo and, and all these teams that are out there to be able to help support and get the full field. Because watching a race without a full field, in my opinion, is just not fun. I agree with you, Doug, and you brought up some great points there. Certainly, the NHRA has got to understand flexibility, especially for you guys that are the part-time teams. You all are definitely more important than you ever have been. Just look at Pomona. That's a great uh, case in point to look at. And even Phoenix, there was just one car over 16 making 17 cards. So these full fields are coming harder and harder to come by. Now, you brought up the schedule. You brought up two-day events. I agree with you. I definitely think the NHRA has got to look at some of those things. With your background with the IHRA, which I think back in 
the early 2000s, the IHRA is putting on a great show with their nitro cars and alcohol funny cars. So with that background, looking at NHRA, let's brainstorm here a little bit. What are some things that you think the NHRA could implement in 2021 concerning the schedule? For example, let me pitch this to you. Two-day event, three, day, three rounds of qualifying on Saturday with a guaranteed night qualifying session, or even why not a Saturday night primetime race? Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not against that. I think you have to dabble a little bit and learn. I think I'm not even against a Friday night and two on Saturday, okay? Because if I could fly some of my guys in on Friday morning, in some cases, I think anything that you can, I think you try different things. And I think even if it didn't save me money on that particular race, if they tried something different, I think I would applaud them for, for at least investigating the fact of what works, okay? In IHRA, we were all about night racing. That was, that was it, okay? And that's something to get used to because we were not necessarily in, you know, stellar lighting, you know? I mean, 90% of those tracks, they didn't even know what Musco lighting was, okay? So um, we were bringing light towers in at 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon just so we could see. Um, and Clay will back that one up and, and all the guys. But, you know... If they attempt it, there's a lot of things you can do. You can look at, I do agree on the three runs, okay? Because as much as I'm a proponent for two-day races, so we're going to go to Bristol. We're a fairly new team. We could hiccup on Saturday and really screw ourselves, possibly, because we only have eight, ten runs of data. So if that's the case, we could put ourselves in a position where we qualify terribly or don't qualify, okay? Um, we missed the spring, and you know, we got Phoenix in, but now the spring is done. We're gonna be going now, you know, does a team like ours, you know, survive the 130 and 140 degree track temperatures? Because that's what we're going to, okay? Um, if you think it's going to be cool in Gainesville, you know, June 5th or 6th or whatever you think it's going to be, uh, you obviously haven't been down to Florida, you know. So um, so those are things that can, could, could actually hurt us. I'm not sure. We're still a new team. We'll figure it out. You know, if it does, we'll learn from it and we'll try and make sure that we're ready for it next time it happens. Um, but overall, um, I applaud the I, – I like your idea, you know, of – Maybe if it's a two-day race, maybe we do a Friday and Saturday, you know. Um, and what I like about that is if there is any weather conditions, we have Sunday as a backup. Our fans are understanding. If we get washed out on a, on a Saturday night or something like that, well, the, the last couple rounds could be run on, on Sunday afternoon, you know. And we don't have to worry about, you know, transporting back or finishing a race somewhere else, you know that's anticlimactic for the fans that came to that race when we finish it at the next race, you know? Um, so I think we have to look at just, and I'm not saying NHRA doesn't put on a good show, but we have to evolve. We have to evolve the sport into something that allows us to, more importantly, I think the number one thing to fix our problem is, and I don't know what the answer is, and I have very few suggestions on this category, we have to figure out how to attract younger fans. That's our number one problem, okay? How to fix that, I don't know, okay? Um, I have a lot of suggestions on it. I think a shorter race, like the, the couple-day race, reduce the cost, um, may help in, you know, on a Friday night show, maybe we reduce the price a little bit. I don't know. Get the fan in there, give them a, you know, uh, a pass that's in a non-reserve seat or something that's a little bit less expensive and introduce the sport to them on a Friday night session. If you don't like nitro cars under the lights, you'll never like them. Plain and simple. Okay. So I, I like, I'm not a huge fan of night racing. Okay. Because I've been through it, but NHRA tracks have great lighting. So, so some of the problems that I had in the past with the IHRA side would not be a problem. But 
um, I really am a believer that night racing would enhance our crowd, no doubt about it. Um, maybe some more things that were interactive with the fans. I mean, we obviously had every ticket to pit pass, which is great. Okay, it's something most sports don't have, but the ability to somehow get them to interact a little bit more hands on. Um, but uh, I definitely think that reducing the schedule, we have to try and figure out how to get it down to 18 races. I don't know how. Okay, I don't know how that pans out. I don't know how that works. You know, um, I think two day races, maybe trying some night ones, maybe some Friday, Saturday, maybe some Saturday, Sunday, try them, you know, but maybe a little bit more transparency between NHRA and the racer. Not necessarily pro organization because some people aren't members, you know, there's benefits to that, but transparency with the, I think if we go into this as a group problem and try and figure it out as a group, a lot of times NHRA will be analyzing something that we'll never know they are. And then a clear cut decision comes down about something we didn't even know they were thinking about, you know? I mean, it's not that hard every four races to have, uh, you know, a 15, 20 minute meeting between some of the team owners and drivers and whatever, and let's just discuss it. If you're thinking about something, great, let's discuss it. Maybe we can help. Maybe we can commit some of our time to making that interaction with the younger fan better. You know, if, if they came up with something like that and we didn't donate our time to, to make the experience better, then shame on us, you know? But we have to come up with something, you know? I personally went back racing because my partner, Tim Lewis, nicest guy you'll ever meet in your life, okay? is 75 years old, okay? I'm 55. We're never getting another shot at this again. So let's go do it. Without people like Chip, our race schedule would be extremely short. But we weren't doing it for that. We were doing it because I love Tim Lewis. He's probably my best friend in my life. He gave me an opportunity to do something that nobody ever would. I never would have introduced myself to whatever sponsor I had in my career without him giving me the opportunity to get my career started. So it was an opportunity for us to say, let's just go racing. Let's go have some fun. Let's, if we go to three races, we go to three, we go to nine, we go to nine, whatever, whatever the good Lord gives us, we're going to do. But um, that's kind of where we're at, you know, but now we see the ability to maybe participate in helping the NHRA make their product better. And that's what these smaller teams are doing. You know, we are a true, you know, participant now in trying to make this sport better. You bring up some interesting things there, Doug. I have to ask, let me throw this point out. So NASCAR has a team owner's council. They have a driver's council. They have a fan council. Apparently what, the NHRA doesn't have anything like that? I mean, you know, there's pro, we have pro organization, which helps the, the, you know, the race teams, the people who want to participate in that. And pro is pretty good about keeping in touch with people that are not, um, you know, with, with people that are not, um, you know, um, pro will include teams that are not actually, you know, people who are not included in pro. So I want to make sure that, you know, they're real good about letting me know stuff even if I'm a member or not. But that's a relationship between, you know, really pro and NHRA. As far as I know, there's no council, there's no nothing. Um, and I, like I said, I think that transparency, those, those conversations would be helpful. Now I'm not against bringing some fans in that have some great ideas, you know? And these days you don't necessarily have to have meetings. I mean, God, we're in a digital era, you know? You can do this thing online on Monday nights you know, once a month, the first Monday of every month and have a representative from a couple teams, you know, uh, Clay Milliken, he's a great representative for our, you know, for our industry, you know, um, fans love him. But, uh, you know, so we could have people that are representative from each group and just participate. And I would think that that would warrant some good conversation and some ideas. Awesome, man. Look, you mentioned Tim Lewis throughout this 
interview, I've got to ask, looking at footage from years ago, you two have been together for a while. How did you meet Tim? How did the relationship build and grow? And give me what has been the highest moment in Foley Lewis Racing? What's been the lowest moment in Foley Lewis Racing? Um, well, first I met Tim through my racing school. I had a racing school that I started uh, and it, it is actually 20 years that I kept the business. Um, and I started in uh, April of 97 and sold it in 17. Um, so it was a great run and it introduced me to a lot of those people that we're talking about that's in the stands um, and, uh, and at all these NHRA races. But Tim was a customer, came to the school, and we really hit it off. Um, we were staying in the same hotel uh, when, when I was doing a two-day school uh, at ATCO, um, which we talked about earlier before we went on camera. And um, so, um, it, you know, we just hit it off and we got to know each other. And at that time, I was driving um, a blown alcohol dragster, uh, an NHRA top alcohol dragster. And I, I owned that. and and we were we were a mediocre car at best i was just a guy that had a, had more passion than dollars um and so we just built this relationship and got to know each other and and built that probably i would say a year or two it really took a little while for that relationship to gel and get to the point where we became best friends um and we we went, we kind of took a couple of years and really refined that alcohol dragster program. Um, you know, he brought a lot of business knowledge to the table. So when I was working with a potential sponsor, I would talk to him about it and give him some ideas and some thoughts. Um, you know, he always supported the team with parts and pieces and, and, but to be honest with you, it was always really like an unbelievable friendship. It really was, you know, um, good days i mean an alcohol dragster we won two races in seven days which was a lot of fun you know so we ended off i think that was oh three i think that was our last year in alcohol dragster that we won those two uh lucas oil races um that was a lot of fun and then when you know he gave me my opportunity to go you know actually into the ihra and do some top fuel racing we bought a car from bruce Litton and um we, we really had no idea what we were doing we really did we didn't understand the animal that we you know that we bit off but um you could do that those days in the ihra you know you really could that's another difference between what we had then and what we have now if you did that today at the highest level in the nhra god you wouldn't survive you'd, you'd be you'd be chewed up and spit out you know, um, but you could do that then. And, and that was, I'm not sure that I would have a program. Well, I don't want to say about now because I still say that the, you know, um, the question is still to be told on where the program, where the level of our program is now. We're still working on that. But the program that we had up until, you know, 2009, 10, 11, um, Without the IHRA, that program wouldn't have been what it was. I could have never entered the NHRA at the level we did if I didn't have, you know, 150 runs a year on the IHRA side for multiple years before I ever tried to, to take on that task. And it was just done differently, you know. I'll truly say, not that I'm not saying the NHRA doesn't do this, but if we fired up our car going into a final in the IHRA and we didn't hear our opponent fire up his car in X amount of time, we went over there and helped him. You know, we'd fix the damn car. We'd bring over parts, you know. I mean, it was just a different situation. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, hey, listen, without, you know, I don't know that our team would be where it is without Bobby Lagana and Dom and, and those guys over at Capco, you know, um, you know, they have helped us a lot. And that helped 
does not go unappreciated. I can tell you that. Um, those are guys who check in on us when they don't have to. Bobby Lagana comes over and checks in on us and just, you guys okay? You know, and I can appreciate that. But Bobby came from there. That's where I met Bobby. And my relationship with Bobby was one of the first people that I got to meet. And, you know, he cut his teeth in the English towns where we were talking about earlier. You know, I mean, Bobby was out there every, you know, I'd, I'd go there with my alcohol car to go testing or go to a Lucas race. And Bobby would show up on a ramp truck, you know, with the, the front of the car covered, you know, with a, with a plastic tarp to make sure it was okay. You know, I mean, it was just the appreciation I have for the Lagana family. But when I went to IHRA, those were the people I met. And they, they didn't care that you were competing against them. They truly didn't. They were going to help you as much as they helped themselves. And all we cared about is that we all got to the starting line. We all went there <clears throat> first that nobody killed, you know, killed themselves. And, and then we were always there giving advice or helping each other out. And, you know, Todd Payton was a competitor there, the Payton family, you know, and, uh, you know, when Todd's brother was there, you know, tuning the car and, and doing some of that with his dad and, you know, those are people that we just, we just had a blast. I mean, you know, we raced at night. So, you know, you didn't go to sleep till three in the morning, you know, I mean, that's just the way it went, you know, and anytime you bring Bob Gilbertson to a night race, <laughs> you better watch out, you know, it's going to get funner than you want it to, you know, um, but uh, it, it was just a blast. It really was, you know, if there was that type of experience out there right now, there's no doubt that myself and Tim, would participate in an opportunity like that for sure, because we're competitors and on a 10 race schedule, we got to run for a championship, you know, and when you're racing for a championship, you really feel like you're more part of something, which we don't get that opportunity with NHRA. <clears throat> we're not part of a championship run. We have to look at each race and each day as a competition. But at the end of the day, we have to go home that weekend and we're not part of a competition as far as an overall competition because we don't, you know, we don't get to participate in something like that. We'd love to, but we, we, we can't. We just can't financially. But, um, you know, and that leads us back into your worst moment, <laughs> which was, uh, you know, I, you know, actually Clay posted it this week or last week or whatever. Um, everybody was a little a little bored and he was just picking videos out and, and clay posted it and it was mine and him racing in the final in Cayuga uh 06 and um you know that was a race that you know I think to be almost exact I believe I was 17 points ahead on a championship run I was in first you know and that was a Monday morning makeup from a Sunday rain out. Um, and uh, I'm not positive, but I almost think that that was a rescheduled race already because Cayuga typically wasn't in September. So I just thought of that. So chances are it was a rain out and we went back and then rained probably Sunday. And, um, you know, we had set the record in the semis, um, Canadian record. And um, so we felt good about that. And of course, it's unusual racing with 100 fans in the seats, you know. Um, but, you know, Clay was keeping pace with us. And um, here he goes. He's in the final. We have lane choice. We just came from a, a really good situation. And uh, we felt pretty, we felt pretty darn sure that we were going to be able to win that race. <clears throat> which would have put a, a definitely a bigger burden on those guys to try and keep up with us with two races left. And, um, you know, it just, I guess it wasn't my time, you know, um, it went out there and shook hard. And, um, you know, when you look at the whole thing, um, it probably, you know, the only thing we can come up with, I really feel like it knocked me out. It shook that hard. I've been in a lot of tire shake. But um, that one was just unprecedented for me. Um, and um, I, I truly believe I was just, you know, I was knocked out and, and, you know, bracing, you know, for the best. 
unfortunately, I was bracing with my foot still on the throttle. Kind of hard to, you know, consciously take your foot off the throttle when you're not technically conscious, you know. Um, and it just, you know, it, it was a bad day. It was a bad day, you know. Um, so, you know, a team like us to lose a championship, you know, first of all, you know, you always think, you know, it's probably never going to happen to you, you know. Um, and it did. And uh, took me a little while to recover there. You know, I did everything I could to convince the doctors to let me drive, you know, because um, we were a multiple car team at the time. So we had cars, we had everything we needed. And, um, you know, but I broke a lot of ribs and broke a leg, you know, uh, separated shoulder. So I was pretty beat up. But, uh, you know, I'm sure there was no doctor in the world that was going to give me the okay for that one. But uh, I would have done anything to be able to finish that season out. I really would have. Just the opportunity to try and go head to head with Clay would have been, you know, he was our, at the time, I think our six time champ, you know? So for me to get the opportunity, you know, I was number two quite a few years. I won pro rookie of the year and all of that. And it was a blast to race with those guys. It was an honor to race with those guys. They took me in as one of their own in a really short period of time, especially the Lagana family. Um, and we had raced Clay multiple times that year. Um, and we had uh, actually, in, uh, that, yeah, and, um, you know, and came out on the good side. And um, so we, we really just, you know, that's one of my downsides to my career is no less I lost <laughs> a $250,000 check. <laughs> I lost a $250,000 car. And I never got the opportunity to go run heads up against him. It would have been, it would have been a blast. You know, so. I imagine that might have been the lowest moment over the career. Because that was a gnarly accident. That's one of the hardest hits to the wall. I think I've ever seen for a top fuel dragster in the modern area. You took one heck of a wild ride up there at Cayuga. But that's not the only moments that you've had clay in the other lane that were pretty spectacular. Uh, 2004 at Norwalk, there was this crazy pedal fest of a match. Give me the rundown of that final round. Uh, you know how much heat I took for that? You know? I mean, I took a lot of heat for that because – they were like, for a guy who runs a driving school, you can't pedal for shit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the best. You know, it was a really weird race, um, that one. And um, I, tr I only had like half the crew there. That was a rain out. That was a rescheduled race. Um, from when, I don't know. Half my crew couldn't come back. And it was just one of those – those races where um, I would say things fell into our lap, no doubt about it. You know, um, it, that race for us is one of those, I'd rather be lucky than good. Um, but uh, when it's your day, it's your day. And uh, we won first round. <clears throat> I believe I ran Louis Alice in first round. I'm not, not a hundred percent positive, but um, we won first round and then um, got him drawing a blank. We were supposed to run. The Australian kid. I don't know if you remember his name. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, but he drove over here for a while. Um, and um, so we were supposed to drive him second round. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on his name. They broke on the starting line. And um, then we end up with Clay in the, in, in the final. You know, that race went off around midnight, one o'clock in the morning, whenever it was. And uh, it was just it was just a blast to run those guys. It really was. You know, I have a lot of respect for Clay and Clover and those guys and what they've accomplished there is uh, they were a well-oiled machine for a lot of years. And um, and we felt like for a couple of years, we felt like we were the team that was supposed to knock them off, you know. And we did a couple of times, you know, and, and felt good about it. Um, but um, we had a pretty good rivalry there. But, yeah, we both went out and smoked the tires. You know, and you wouldn't have known it because, you know, Norwalk's always a good track and good shape and, and all of that. And, uh, yeah, not sure what happened there. We both went up in smoke and I think I pedaled it 13 times. Um, and Clay did his best. 
you know, to try and catch up to me, but he couldn't, you know, he just saw me out there. Fortunately, I was just far enough in front of him that, you know, like he was trying to catch me. And, you know, uh, I think that being a couple hundred feet ahead of him the whole time, you know, wouldn't allow him to let that car settle down and he would get back on it. And, you know, his car would go to the right and to the left. And, and, and it, it, it was a lot of fun, but uh, yeah. Uh, that was one time that uh, I went top end and my crew looked at me like, what was that all about? <laughs> you probably could have saved that and made that look a lot better. But uh, hey, listen, that was, I think that was our, that was my rookie year. And I think it was my third Ironman of the year. So we were pretty proud to be there out of, you know, 10, 12 races to win three of them. Uh, we felt like we accomplished a lot. And, uh, and for me and Tim Lewis, that, that year was, you know, and that goes back to reducing the cost and making it more reasonable because here's a perfect example. I think that year, not 100% positive, but it's pretty darn close to the number I'm going to quote. <clears throat> if you took our total cost, now we don't mind you only had one full-time guy, okay? And me, I worked obviously for free and did what I had to do. but 10 or 12 races, I think it was 12. We ran the entire season. When you took what we spent to campaign the car and deducted the couple small sponsors, and I say small, okay, um, couldn't equal maybe 10, 15,000 the entire year. You took that and, my, and our winnings and I think it only cost us maybe a hundred and I think it was hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars to run the entire year. How do you? I mean, how do you go wrong with that? You know, I mean, we didn't hurt stuff. You know, it's not like today, and I understand that. And of course, nobody expects that on the NHRA side. Um, at that time, we were running a, a fifty-six gallon fuel pump. A fuel pump on my car now is one hundred and twelve gallons. You know. So, you know, exactly double matter of fact, you know. Um, so when you look at it, you know, I don't, you know, it's just, if we can find our, our way back that direction slightly, I don't know how, but people love night racing. People love night racing, you know. And uh, like I said, I'm not a huge fan of it, but would I do it to see the better good of the sport? Um, I think it would be a, a step in, in the right direction for sure. I'm sure some of the other teams would not agree with me, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we have to figure out, don't worry about the teams. Don't worry about NHRA. We have to figure out how to put the fan first. Absolutely. And whatever that change is, whatever that change is that brings in my son's generation to be fans of the sport so they have a place to race, we got to figure that out. I think, you know, less races, shorter races, smaller budgets. I think all of that would contribute to the ability for teams to be able to, you know, and if you're going to get a bunch of part-time teams, you know, I'm not against trying to figure out how to, I mean, it may sound ridiculous and probably wouldn't work, um, but give the ability for the teams to be, judged on their performance at the races they went to with a minimum of X amount of races, you know? Um, but I think that's premature. I think our focus has to be on the fan first, communication and transparency between us, the fan and NHRA. How do we make this better? Okay. Because we have to look at the fact that the Don Schumachers, the Connie Colettas, you know, these people are not going to be around forever. And that's a transition that we are going to be dealing with probably in the next five years. Okay. So if we have to deal with that hurdle, we haven't dealt with it yet, but if we have to deal with that hurdle five years from now, and we're kind of already dealing it with DSR, they have a lot less teams than they had before. So we're starting to deal with them bringing less, you know, less teams to the track. Um, I don't know. It's something we need to figure out quickly. 
Well, Doug, look, I'm loving this conversation because we're going back to some IHRA days. I personally, even even just in the junior dragsters, I preferred running IHRA over NHRA. I would rather go to IHRA track where, where Shoals Dragway in upstate South Carolina and run compared going down to Commerce, Georgia at Atlanta Dragway. The, the atmosphere was just completely different. It was it was it was more fun and enjoyable to go run at a IHRA event than an NHRA event. And then, and I bring that up to ask this. So I can remember as a young fan, which you've been talking about young fans and pulling them in. I remember the Southern Nationals Friday night qualifying being a stellar show when IHRA was a direct competitor with its card of having top fuel alcohol funny car and pro mod and mount motor pro stock in their Friday night show at great events at like complexes, the Red River Raceway there in Gillum, Louisiana. So do you feel that in drag racing right now that possibly the NHRA needs a direct competitor to maybe urge them a bit to make the program that much more better? You know, yes and no. So the concern of that is we cannot afford to be splitting cars up. That's the last thing we need right now is trying to somebody else coming out and starting an eight race field, an eight race, you know, program schedule and doing something like that, which like I says, we would love to run for a championship or something at that caliber and get those guys together and run all of that. But my concern at this point would be the fact that we are now really spreading the little bit we got into two different racetracks and, and spreading our budgets now because of Doug Foley, does he want to commit to, you know, another venue? You know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I loved those types of races. They were fun. They were affordable. It's something a guy like, you know, two guys like me and Tim could easily do. And you could find somebody like Chip. You know, you didn't need the million dollar deal when you ran those races. A guy like Chip who just wants to see that guy have his opportunity, you know, um, could get you over the hump on being able to go out there and be competitive, you know. Um, and so, I, I'd, in some ways, I'd love to see it happen, but my concern is, is I don't want to be selfish. I think guys in my category would like to see that happen, but it would almost be a selfish move. It would be because it may, it would, it wouldn't, I don't, it wouldn't may, it would directly contribute to the potential f- total fallout of drag racing. We need not to to do anything that could damage the sport. And spreading the cars out and uh, and now NHRA having 11 cars only the entire time would now have them thinking about, God, do we have to go to eight car fields? That's the beginning of the end, you know? Um, so we need not, you know, I, I like the idea, I like the concept. I would have done it five years ago if, if somebody had done it. But I think now we all have to look at what's what's best for the sport. I think we've gone a little too far to think that direction because then you have to look at, it's not just me. You know, would Justin think about it? Possibly. Now he gets to run for a championship. You know, a guy like Scott Palmer, who is committed to running some of the races, but not all, would he go to running possibly a championship? Okay. Would it even dip into some of the Lucas Oil competitors? Does a guy in an A fuel car sit there and say, I could go to six of those races and have some fun and I could be a top fuel guy, you know? So I don't know. In the non-selfish Doug Foley would say, it's probably not a good idea right now, you know? And I love the sport too much to want to see it go in a negative direction any more than it has. You know, I'd like to see, you know, um, I'd like to see us make some changes that would allow it to build back up and, and 
try and figure out is, you know, how do you race for a million bucks? You know, how do you race for that? You know, how do you, how do you put a million dollars together and, and be competitive? I don't know how that is, but, uh, and I don't know what that looks like, but, um, and you're always, you're never going to have financial ability to be able to, you know, take the, the, you know, the top teams that have great personal funding, you're never going to change that. Okay. So it is what it is. And, you know, um, just put your big boy pants on and try and beat them. That's all you can do. But we need cars. We need to figure out how to keep cars coming and how to make it competitive and how to make those smaller teams feel like they're important. And um, so, yeah, I just, uh, I, I like the concept, but I liked it better five, seven years ago. I think now we've gone far enough where we need and every car to be on standby to help this sport survive. And hopefully we can make some of those transitions that we've talked about here to try and figure out how to make it prosper. You know, and I think the junior dragster, you know, you go back to the IHRA days. That's because, you know, we didn't worry about having a junior dragster in our top fuel pits. You know, we didn't think about that. We just came as a family. That's who we were, you know. And, you know, when my kid wanted to run Edmonton, just because it was a different country and it'd be cool, you know, I, you know, I, I think we just, I mean, it took us about five minutes on the internet to put, a, you know, and, well, at that time, I, you know, even though there was an internet, but, um, you know, put some phone calls together and you had people that would just lend you a car. They didn't care, you know, and at the time you had all of his buddies because they were friends and hanging out and 12 races a year, or whatever that was. Plus we had all the families, you know, and it wasn't unusual for you know, when my kid was going to the starting line to go run a race, you better believe Bobby and Dom were up there watching him, you know, just because we were truly family. That's what we were, you know. You didn't have to worry about, you know, did you put, have enough stuff in your cooler or food or whatever. You just walked over the next guy's pit area and you ate, you know. You didn't think about any of that, you know. So there was a lot less corporations involved and a lot more love for the sport you know, and real connection with your competitor. So that's something that don't know that we'll ever have that again, you know, um, but that's what my kids grew up on. Apparently that's what you, you know, uh, you know, uh, what you enjoyed when you got to go. And uh, junior dragster racing was probably one of the most fun things I ever did with my kids because, you know, yes, we wanted to win. But we truly liked the person in the other lane, and it was, you know, that relationship. And, and that was the same way with, with our top fuel cars. You know, we, of course, we wanted to beat the guy in the other lane. But, you know, if we didn't, we'd go over and help him. You know, we'd fix his stuff. If he broke down the side of the highway, we were there. You know, and uh, so some of that, we got to bring back some of, the, you know, uh, some of the passion for the sport a little bit more than just the cubic dollars. Doug, I think that was a very sensible word on that question. Thank you for your insight there. Look, we've been talking about night racing, and I know a lot of other drivers, they do not like night racing for whatever it is with these cars, and maybe you can clue us in on that as well. But I've got to ask, back in those IHRA days, you all in the fuel cars would go race at some sketchy tracks. <laughs> Tell me. What was the track like? Oh, no, I do not want to rip down 1320 at night at this place. And tell me, what track even today on the NHRA schedule might be a bit of a bear at night? Well, sketchy was a compliment. <laughs> okay. I mean, we used to go down some tracks. And first of all, when I first got the opportunity to drive a top fuel car, I would just love the opportunity to drive a top fuel car. So to me, if you told me to go down that thing at three in the morning, I did it, you know. <clears throat> but there's no doubt that we went down tracks at times that we should have been paid battle pay. There is no doubt about that. Um, the biggest problem was is, you know, 
hey, listen, God rest his soul, Jim Weiner worked his butt off to make sure that those tracks were in great shape, okay? Um, he was just one of those guys that if Jim told you that track was good, it was good, okay? And one of the nicest people I ever met. And um, he was the guy that was, you know, there when I got my accident. And um, they just, I trade had some good people, no doubt about it. And, um, but with that being said, there's just so good you can make a track that time of night. Or when the dew point matches the temperature and you're like, I, I can't even see, you know? Um, so it was, it was quite, the challenge. There's no doubt about it. And then on top of that is it really took off. I mean, IHRA back in four, five, six, seven, there was times at Rockingham before we ever warmed up a fuel car. They had locked the gate, sold out. Thank you very much. Okay. And Rockingham's, you know, it's a nice size facility. And my last top fuel race in Rockingham, we had 56 pro mods in the lanes. 56, okay? 16 car fuel. I mean, you want to talk about unbelievable. You know, we probably, we had an eight car field there. So my guess is we were probably, we probably had 16, 18 cars, you know? So it was, you know, uh, no lack of cars. The, the, the audience was unbelievable. I mean, you know, we weren't, you know, stay out of the pit type of guy. We'd bring people in. We sat kids in our cars, you know, um, took pictures with them and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, that connection there was was just, uh, it was a lot of fun. The night racing, it was, it was just, you know, you were expected to run fast. Me and Clay typically were you know, or, you know, Clay and Bobby or, you know, I mean, everybody, you know, those last two, three pairs, you know, you were the show and people sat there for a long time at times. And we were, we were kind of, we felt like we were obligated to, you know, to do whatever it took, you know, backpedal it at the 60 foot mark if you needed to. Um, but there were some tracks there that, you know, if you had a couple of cars with uh, with their headlights on at the finish line, you would have been better off, you know? I mean, you know, places like Mile and Grand Bend, you know, um, at one time, you know, uh, they came up to me on Saturday. We had a terrible Friday night deal at Mile and everybody lifted, you know, and all of this. And um, they came to me and they were like, what's the problem? And I'm like, we can't see a darn thing. We, we just can't see anything, guys. You have to give us something to aim for, you know? I mean, this thing does go 300 miles an hour, okay? And any time that we have any thought in our mind of unsurety, we're going to lift, you know? And um, so, they, you know, they would do whatever they could at the point, you know? They brought light towers in and did this, and then we would look at it, and we were like, guys, point the light towers, turn them around, please. You know, light towers in your face don't exactly help. You know, they work fine if they have a 90 foot boom, but with a 30 foot boom, they're just blaring in your eyes, you know? So turn them around and point them, just give us a, something to aim for. And, um, you know, the show was 10 times better that night and, and all of that. So, you know, but th we do have, you know, speaking of NHRA now, going to night racing, there are some tracks that are slightly antiquated. There are. They were considered top tracks in the 80s and 90s. Okay. The reinvestment in these tracks is not there 100% of the time. Okay. So, and if in their defense, they're making a half or third of the money they used to. Okay. Our audience are down. Tickets are up price wise, you know. So, in their defense, it's hard to reinvest. And I understand their problem. But overall, you know, if you're going to night racing, there's a couple tracks out there that I would be concerned about. You know, they just don't have the ability um, for us to run a good show. You know, so that was with updates that would have to be made if that was taken in consideration. 
and maybe you leave those couple as day races for a while while you're investigating it, you know. Um, but again, it comes back to the communication. You know, if NHRA was up front with those tracks and said, listen, we're going to have to figure out a plan if you want to stay part of the schedule. We have to figure out a plan to get you money to do this, or we'll bring in light towers. We'll find a sponsor to pay for light towers or whatever we need to do to make that feasible. You know, you're going to get some pushback. How old are you? I'm 31. Okay. You're young. Okay. One thing you have is, is a good portion of our drivers are getting a little older. Okay. They go to bed earlier. <laughs> And, you know, night racing is just, it's more involved. It's definitely more involved. You know, you're up later, you're with your crew longer, your hours are longer. And sometimes the, the late night falls into the early qualifying the next day, just because it has to be done. And, you know, um, but it is what it is. We're all going to have to suck it up. If we want to make this better, we're all going to have to figure it out. You know, um, I trade was a little too far with the night racing. I have a time ticket that I believe says 118 in the morning at uh, Bud's Creek. <clears throat> okay. And um, that didn't need to happen. There was one crew chief that decided we were going racing and uh, that didn't need to happen. And we had to go up there just because one guy decided we needed to. Um, but overall, you know, we pushed it too late. We were, you know, they were truly about giving the show regardless of what hour. NHRA is not going that far. There's no doubt we can time that product properly. Whatever coast we're on, basically just watch your sunset, okay? You know, fuel cars need to be at least 30 minutes after sunset, you know, um, to get the full advantage. So whatever time sunset is, start, start with your pro mods or, or pro stock or whatever, work yourself into a good program, start with one night session, see how it works out, see if it brings, but you got to, you can't just try something, you know, and do it for six races and say, oh, well, this is what the feedback was. It's not, you know, come on. It took us 60 years to get this sport, you know, where it is today, you know, and, you know, so we have to try things. We have to figure it out. We have to see if it works. We have to be flexible. We have to understand that the dollar value is going to be maybe not down, but the two days overall are better overall. As long as we can reduce our expenses and over and all of that, the, you know, because, you know, we want to bring, you know, look at the fact of, uh, you know, some of these times NHRA, We'll bust these kids in as part of a school program. Well, great. How could you get better attendance than free tickets? So bus them in. Space out our Friday a little bit where they can at least get one session where those buses can come in and those kids can see it. They can walk the pits and be part of it. So you look at our schedule and you space it out a little bit. It's a little bit of a longer day, you know, if we're doing a, a three qualifier, you know. So doing it two and six and whatever, whatever we're going to have to be flexible to, if we don't build the sport back up, there's not going to be one, you know, for my kid's generation and definitely his kids, you know, we're going to have to figure it out. So um, I think communication is a big part of it. Doug, man, look, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time with you. We're going to wind it down though. And I want to end with this question, give you an opportunity give you the last word towards your fans, partners, and those pesky competitors. Go. <laughs> well, the pesky competitors, I just hope I'm a car length ahead of you. Okay. Um, you know, to my fans, I put fans, Tim Lewis, everybody, you know, uh, you know, Chip, these are all people that Doug Foley would be just a guy who was probably out cutting the grass today instead of talking to you. Um, and, you know, and I've just gotten an opportunity over the last 20 years that is, is a miracle, okay? And, yes, I fought for it, but at the same time, if it wasn't for Tim Lewis, you wouldn't be having this conversation with me. If it wasn't for the Bobby Laganas and the Clay Millikens and the Bruce Littons and all those people that we raced against at the IHRA level, I wouldn't be there. 
you know, um, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. The fans was unbelievable for us because to be honest with you, my fans were directly related to my business at the time. I had a racing school. Those people wouldn't, you know, if I wasn't able to promote my name, which indeed promoted my business, I, I wouldn't have been able to survive this long to be able to, to do this. And, you know, and, and have the opportunity to go at 55 years old, you know, um, you know, starting a new top fuel team. Uh, to our fans, I'm a little disappointed we're going to see less of them this year just because of the way the schedule ended up. Um, we're going to miss a lot of them at ZMAX, but we get the opportunity to see them again in the fall, you know, which is great because that's our hometown. You know, my shop is 14 miles from ZMAX Dragway, you know, so um, we're going to get to see some of our fans, um, but not as much as we would have liked because our schedule probably would have been a little bit longer, um, more races. But um, hey, listen, in these times, we have to appreciate the fact that everybody's being safe. Um, the, this is uncharted territories. You know, me and my wife were talking about it on the way to lunch today. You know, my parents had to deal with the depression. We had to deal with, you know, COVID-19 and 9-11, you know, and being a New Yorker. I mean, my, you know, my parents and my brother lived on the island of Manhattan that same day okay and we're on the island when it happened so you know her bro uh my wife's bro uh, brother-in-law was in a building right down the street so you know so all of this stuff has affected our lives and changed our lives and you know in the grand scheme of things yeah we're disappointed we can't race and everything but you know what you know a lot of lives have been lost in this we have to take this serious we have to do whatever we can to help each other out and uh you know we have to watch out for the you know for the older folks because obviously this is hitting them hard and you know a lot of my fans are probably that age group they really are you know um and just stay safe you know we'll have racing back in a couple months and uh i don't think i can you know polish the strutmaster logo anymore okay it's about as clean as it can be okay and uh if uh, Chip decided to show up to the shop, he'd be, appreciate the way the car looks. Um, but we just, you know, we're probably as prepared, and I'm sure every other team is as prepared as they possibly could be for the season. And uh, we're going to feel like we're rushed going into it. Um, but, hey, listen, we'll, uh, we'll all stay safe, and uh, you do as well. And uh, it won't be long. You know, uh, eight, nine weeks, we'll be back out there. And, uh, and uh, my message to everybody, just stay safe and be good. Definitely. We all want to get back at the racetrack. For Doug Foley, Drag Racing TV brought to you by the Suspension Experts, Strutmasters.com. I'm Lee Kraft, the Monday morning racer. Drag Racing fan, God bless and keep the pedal to the metal. <laughs>